So, have you ever wondered how to quickly set up a 2D heat and health system with an animation and a health bar? You know, a basic mechanic where you click on your character or your enemy sprite and it just instantly plays a cute effect and shows the updated data? Well, today we're gonna see that in our modern game engines, that's actually quite easy to do. Hello everyone, I'm Mina, and in this quick God of War C-Sharp tutorial, we're going to see how to set up a simple hit and health system for a 2D game. So in this video, I'll be running you through the assets that I set up and the code that I wrote to make this little demo, and we'll see how to gradually go from a simple static sprite to a nicely animated clickable element with a health bar above it that updates every time we interact with it. Okay, first things first, let's talk about the overall structure of this demo scene. As you can see in the hierarchy over there, here we're using almost only control-derived nodes, or in other words, nodes that create UI elements and all have a green icon in the Godot editor. So we have a basic control for the root of our UI that just spans over the entire screen, and then for the background node, we're using a color rect. This allows us to easily set our background color in the inspector, and again, this element stretches to the entire screen. Finally, on top of that, our buffalo sprite from Kenny's pack is displayed thanks to a texture rect node that is placed at the center of the screen. All in all, we can keep most of the options as is, there is however one important thing to do, and that's to ensure that the pivot offset of the sprite is set to be half its size. This way, when we apply our animation in a second, it will scale and rotate relative to the proper anchor point. And speaking of animation, this effect is handled by the animation player node that is hooked to our texture rect, and the animation player node is a super versatile node type that can animate virtually any property on any node in your current scene. It uses keyframes and interpolation to auto compute the values in between the ones that you manually defined with the keyframes. For example, here, if we take a look at the animation editor at the bottom, we notice a few things. First, our animation player contains just a single animation resource, the take hit anim. This effect is quite short, it's only 0.3 seconds, because we want it to be immediate and punchy. Also, it's composed of three tracks that each animate one property of our buffalo sprite. So we have its scale and its rotation, that are both relative to the pivot point we just adjusted, and its self-modulated color property, which is basically its global tint. Each track contains a few keyframes, shown either as diamonds or small rectangles of color for the modulate property, and I've made sure to slightly offset the keys between each track, cause this creates a more natural and less robotic movement. So if we preview this, we see that it gives us a simple but effective hit anim for a sprite that nicely conveys the idea of a fast punch. Of course, you can adapt it to your liking, and you could even go way further with some shaders to have the whole sprite flash white, for example, but here, this is going to be enough, and it actually already gives a pretty good dose of dynamism to our system. Okay, now that we know how this scene is set up, let's see how to interact with our sprite so that when we click on it, this animation plays, and we get some cool floating numbers that could represent the damage or the score. Because we're using UI nodes, getting user interactions is really straightforward, cause basically, any control-derived node has three readily available signals for that kind of stuff. The mouse entered, mouse exited, and GUI input signals. The two mouse-related ones are pretty self-explanatory, and they can help you create some hover effects, for example. But here, we're going to go with the GUI input signal. It will allow us to get other types of events, such as mouse clicks. To actually handle all of this, we're going to give our scene root node a new C-sharp script called Game Manager that does the following. To begin with, we're going to get a few references to some assets in our project. Here, I've defined two variables. The first one is the prefab that we'll use for the floating text, so the damage or score, and the second one is a ref to the animation player node inside our buffalo texture rect, which as you can see is auto set in the ready function over here. For the floating text prefab, 
I'll be using this basic scene that simply contains a label node, which is Godot's built-in node for displaying text in an interface. I've only changed some of its theme override settings to customized style, such as the color and the thickness of the outline around the characters, the font size, and the actual font asset. For this example, I'm using a font called Sobiscuit. It's a completely free type font by Kerasen that you can download on various fontlib sites such as Dafont. And so after importing the font file in the project, you just need to reference it in the font override slot of the label node to use it in your interface. So then once you've saved this hierarchy as a good scene in the project, you simply need to set it in the root node inspector. This slot has appeared thanks to the export attribute in our c script, and if it isn't showing for you, make sure that you've properly saved your script and manually recompiled the Godot c -sharp project. That's because c -sharp is a compiled language and not an interpreted language like GDScript, so it can't auto-detect the changes in your code, and you have to manually recompile whenever you want to get the updates from your script. Okay, so now with those variables ready, we can take a look at the real meat of the logic, the GUI input signal callback method. To create a callback for the GUI input signal of a UI element, like our texture rect, all we have to do is declare a function with this prototype, so a void function that takes in an input event variable. This event variable can then be inspected to check what exactly just happened, so what event was generated by the user. And this way you can see if the event type that was generated is the one that you're interested in. Typically here, to check if the player left-clicked on our sprite, we'll do three checks. First, we'll use an is pattern to check that we had an event of input event mouse button type. Second, that it was a press and not a release. And third, that it was indeed the left mouse button. So to sum up, this if block executes when we left-click on a UI element. And inside, we'll simply play our animation using our reference to the animation player node, and call a private function in our script that spawns a little dynamic text at the position of our click. Note that here I'm going to use a random value to get a bit of variety on the actual number that is displayed, but in a real game, this would of course probably depend on the overall state of the game. But anyway, so the method that spawns those dynamic text is below, and if we open it, we see that it's divided in three parts. First, we have a few lines that instantiate our label based on the prefab that we created before. It stringifies the number value passed to the function to fill its text property, and it places it at the given 2D position on the screen. So here, our mouse click location. Then we have a big block that uses something called a twin, repetitively. And finally, at the end, we wait for this twin thing to complete, and then we destroy our label object to clean it up. Of course, the interesting part is the one in the middle, with the twin object. So what exactly is a twin? Well, twin is short for in-between. The twins are common objects in game engines that allow us to easily interpolate a property between a start and an end value in a given time, and usually with some extra controls like the easing. For example, suppose that we have some object that is on the ground, and we want it to fly up to a height of 1. Then, by using a twin, we could let the engine compute all the intermediary positions, and thus get a nice fluid movement like this. Basically, it's a bit like manually updating the height of our object each frame in our update loop, except that it's all taken care of for us, and we don't have to worry about the details after we've started the twin. Plus, by changing the easing, we could drastically change the effect and make it more or less natural. In Godot, twins are created on the fly, so you take your current scene tree with the getTreeGlobal function, and then you call its createTwin method. This twin object will be valid in this function, just at that point in time, and then it will be automatically cleaned up when it's finished running. So here, after we've created it, we're using the parallel mode for twin to have our various interpolations happen at the same time, rather than be sequential. And finally, we define our three twin effects to have our vertical Y position bounce up with a little elastic field at the end, our horizontal X position spring randomly towards the left or the right, and our text global alpha value fade out to zero. 
By the way, you also notice that Godot lets us do a really neat trick here, which is to directly animate a specific component of a vector or a color just by using the colon character. So we don't have to actually deconstruct, update, and then reconstruct our vectors or colors, which is really cool and handy. At the end of our function, we use the C sharp async await system to have our method pause until all these twin auto movements have finished executing. And only then, we delete our dynamic label to clean everything up. And now, with all this logic ready, all that's left to do is to connect it to our sprite's QI input signal. So let's go back to our editor and in our TextureRex node panel, link the GUI input event to our new on buffalo GUI input callback function. And that's it! If we play our game now, you see that whenever we click on our buffalo sprite, our little animation plays, and we get some random floating numbers that bounce up and disappear thanks to our twin. Alright, so that's pretty cool. But now we can actually take this one step further and explore how to add a health bar to our buffalo to keep track of its current health points. To wrap up this hit and health mechanic, time to work on the second half and add a health bar to get a more readable mechanic with on-screen info. To create this kind of basic health bar in Godot, we can actually use a cool built-in UI node type, the progress bar. As the name implies, this component is an easy way of showing a relative value or a percentage as a filling bar and you see that by customizing its style a little, we can get a nice thing that fits with the styles of Kenny's animal sprite quite well. So basically, in the inspector of this node, you'll notice that at the top we have the base variables that determine the range and the current value of the progress bar. So if I display the percentage label in the middle, and then I play around with the max value and the value properties, you see that this percentage adapts as expected. Then below, we have the usual transform options. Here, the trick is often to impose some minimal size, so that even if we don't show the percentage label in our bar, it still doesn't shrink down to an invisible size. And of course, the final step is to give our element some custom styles in its theme override section. For a progress bar, there are two styles that we can define and tweak, the background and the fill. In this case, we can use fairly similar styles in both slots, for example with reddish tints, dark heavy contours, and some rounded corners. Setting up this type of override is interesting because it helps better integrate this element in the rest of the UI, and typically in this demo, it's nice to have it match the style of our icon. Now we can update our game manager script to have the value property of the progress bar change at runtime and complete our hit and health system. So first, we'll export a new reference to our progress bar, rebuild our project, and assign it in the inspector of our root node. Note that, of course, you could also get it automatically in the ready function, if you prefer. Then in the ready hook, we'll initialize our progress bar value to its max value, so that it starts completely full. Now, last but not least, in our on buffalo GUI input callback method, we'll update the end of the function, so that our random value can be used both by our dynamic label generator and our progress bar update logic. And this logic basically just reduces the value property of the element while making sure it stays above zero. And here we are! If we play our game again, we see that there's now a health bar that is shown above our icon and that properly updates each time we click on a sprite. As a last little improvement, we could also show a second sprite when the health bar reaches zero, and block our logic so that the element becomes non-clickable if the buffalo is out. To do that, we just need a second sprite, like this one that I adapted from Kenny's original image, and then in our code we could do the following. At the top, we'd get a reference to our texture rect node, so that we can change its texture easily, and we'd also define a boolean flag to know if our buffalo is alive or not. Then in the callback logic, we would need to update this flag and the texture of our icon element if we reach zero health points, and of course exit early to interrupt the whole method and ignore the event if the boolean is false. 
Also, on that note, you see that loading resources at runtime in Godot is really quite easy. You just have to use the gd.load function, and then you put the res prefix to refer to your project's asset folder root, and you write the path to your file with the extension. Also, in c -sharp, you'll need to explicitly cast it to the right type, which you can do with this generic syntax. And there we go. If we try our game again, we see that now, when we get the last hit and the progress bar reaches zero, the sprite indeed changes and the icon becomes unclickable. So, here you go. You now know how to set up a basic hit and health system in Godot, with a variety of control-derived UI nodes, some cool animations to add juiciness to the action, and some signal-based interactions and twin effects. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of good tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.